ready to go. Hello, Emma. So happy to have Hi, you Angelica. today. Been waiting Thank for you. Recording. Thank you for inviting me. Could you start with um, telling us about what you do? I think you can do it better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, the, the funny answer is that I talk professionally about my genitals. Um, <laughs> that's not strictly my job title. Um, so no, my name is Emma Dunn. I am the chair of uh, Agenda, which is the uh, national cross-government network for trans and intersex civil servants and uh, uh, we, we do cover some public sector workers as well. Um, so uh, my full-time role is that I work um, as I say supporting trans and intersex people across the civil service um, and uh, that can involve anything from kind of giving support to you know permanent secretaries and departments who are you know interested in uh, equality uh, for trans and intersex people and it can also involve a lot of the time telling my personal story about being an intersex person. Okay yeah and you're one of the best public speakers I've heard really you make people laugh and cry at the same time. <laughs> um, shall I perhaps give an, an explanation of what intersex is? Uh, I think yes that'd some be great. Of our listeners might not know even though I think everybody probably knows an intersex person because from what I read uh, it's it's um, that as many intersex people as there are people with ginger hair and or green eyes so it's very unlikely that that you know that you wouldn't uh, come across uh, We're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's an umbrella term for individuals to have a combination of what is um, culturally thought of as female uh, or male anatomy uh, and sometimes that is internal, sometimes that is external. Is there anything you would like to add to that? A really good definition of intersex that I really like is just to simply say that intersex people have bodies that don't fit typical binary ideas about male and female. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of things that go into making somebody's body male. There are lots of things that go into making somebody's body female. And there are lots of people who are born with bodies that don't fit nicely and neatly into those kinds of big male and female categories. Mm -hmm. Um, so from here, I think I'd like to bring our um, listeners' attention to uh, what actually defines an individual's gender. Um, what factors are there that we need to consider? Because uh, we know it's not just genitals uh, or, or simply uh, your DNA, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're quite right. And I, I'm going to be really specific here um, because your gender is, is what you are in your head. Uh, and often we talk about gender when we actually mean to talk about sex. Um, so intersex isn't a gender identity. It, my gender identity is female. I understand myself to be female, which is really handy uh, and fortunate in my case, because at birth I was thought to be female and I was assigned female. And I was uh, named female, raised female, socialized female, went to an all girls school, understood myself to be female, still understand myself to be female. The truth is slightly more complicated than that. I'm not actually female. I am intersex. Um, so, yeah, intersex uh, people, as I said, born with a mixture of anatomical sex characteristics uh, that don't fit typical binary ideas about male and female. So what that means is we have five different uh, characteristics. Um, so we have, uh, and these are all the things that go into making your body male or female. So you have, as you've just said, your genitals, and that's the only one we look at at birth. You know, we look at a child between the legs and we go, it's a boy or it's a girl. Or sometimes it, it can, you know, some intersex children are born, many intersex children are born looking entirely like me, entirely female or entirely male. Um, and you don't find out that you're intersex till later on. Some uh, intersex uh, people are born with visibly ambiguous genitals and then that's kind of a giveaway that they are intersex. Um, so, yeah, so you have your... your uh, your genitals, you have your internal reproductive organs, you have your uh, chromosomes, uh, you have your hormone profiles, and you also have what we call secondary sex characteristics, which are all of the characteristics of your body that appear at puberty. Uh, so they're things like your height, your voice pitch, your facial hair, your chest development. So all of those things uh, tend to be different between men and women and those differences appear at puberty. So, so secondary sex characteristics is kind of an umbrella term that captures all of those extra kind of bits and pieces. And if you think about it, because there's so many things that go into making you male or female, there's actually loads of different ways of being intersex because there's loads of ways that your body might not neatly line up with you know, lots of people do, lots of people have all, you know, entirely, you know, female characteristics or entirely male characteristics, but there's lots of ways that you can have a, a difference or a, or a variation. So the variation that I have, I have um, 
an, an intersex variation called Swire syndrome, and I, it means that I have XY chromosomes. So genetically, I am male. Um, if I, uh, my understanding is that if I murdered somebody and left behind some DNA, um, and uh, the police came along, they would be telling the, uh, the, well, the forensics people would be telling the police that a man committed the crime, which does make a murder spree seem almost inevitable some days. Um, <laughs> But thanks to a variation on my Y chromosome, uh, my body developed along entirely female lines. I have some internal differences, uh, but externally I'm entirely female. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a surprise uh, to find out. Well, I was diagnosed at, at 14, but my diagnosis was withheld from me. Um, we can probably talk about that later. Um, so, uh, but I worked out the truth and I worked out the truth when I was about 20, 21 years old, I think, 22, wow, okay. so I, remember, I can't remember now, it's a long time, but I'm very old now. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so I worked out uh, <laughs> later on and it was a big shock because I thought I was female. Why does intersex uh, genital mutilation still happen? What's the medical rationale, rationale for making those decisions? people i really don't think there is any kind of rational reason why this happens i don't know of any i don't know of any other characteristic of your body that you would be born with that's entirely normal and natural but would be operated away in order to appease society mm. you know that, that and that's essentially what's happening i mean i I get that, you know, our, our society is entirely binary in its thinking. Lots of other cultures aren't. Lots of, you know, we're kind of catching up with a lot of other cultures who already understand about non-binary and intersex and trans identities and who have, you know, known about them for thousands of years and are really comfortable. But in this country, we're, you know, a bit behind the times. Um, so, and I think because we've always had that traditionally really binary thinking, you know, like a baby's born, the first question the mum gets asked is, is it a boy or a girl? Um, and then the next question is, you know, what you're going to name the child and we give our children gendered names. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have a baby and the baby's born and the baby has ambiguous genitals, um, you literally can't answer the first two questions that everybody, you can't announce the birth, you can't name the child. And then to add insult to injury in England and Wales, you've got 42 days legally to register that child as male or female. You have to make a choice. You can't, you can't register it. You can't, you can't be honest. You can't actually mm. register the child legally as being intersex. It has to be registered as male or female. So you can really kind of understand why I think um, that, that, that a child is born, they have ambiguous genitals. The decision is made for whatever reason to assign them to a male or female category, give them a male or female name. It then kind of follows that you're going to go, oh, you know, my child's going to be bullied or, you know, they're going to be mocked at school when the changing rooms or whatever. So we need to fix that child to make them entirely male or female. And actually what we know is that that can be intensely damaging to the child. Those operations are often withheld from them. Obviously, you can't give informed consent, uh, the, the children. Um, so uh, often the surgeries are unnecessary. They're, they're not to correct any kind of um problem health issue they're just mm -hmm. they are literally cosmetic surgeries on a child's genitals which is just appalling and also you're not taking into account how the child is going to grow up to identify so if the child if you make the decision to to feminize this this child and they grow up to say well no actually i'm male i understand myself to be male you've already conducted surgeries that take them further away from who they actually are mm -hmm. and then that makes it even harder to, to take them back again so i, I genuinely don't understand the rationale for it it is, it happens, it happens all the time. It happens in lots and lots of Western civilized, civilized countries and, and it's appalling and it needs to stop. We have to stop intersex genital mutilation. Absolutely. Um, so how did, you, how did you find out you were intersex and, and how did that affect your life? So I found out, as I say, I was diagnosed at 14 because- It was withheld from you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so puberty didn't happen for me in, in the way it was. And it was a bit of a weird story because I, I had a random medical at school and I was only 14 and, and I hadn't started my period. Um, and, and the nurse had said, you know, that was one of the questions was, have you started your period? And I said, no. And actually by complete chance, the nurse had given my younger sister a medical um, a couple of weeks earlier and my little sister had started her periods at 10. Um, so the nurse thought it was really odd that she had the 14 year old big sister still saying, oh, no, I haven't started. And, and the age of puberty normally runs in families. So she kind of said to my parents, look, I think you need to get this checked out just to make sure that everything's OK. So that was the, the start of a, a long series of tests and investigations. And 
the way that it was explained to me was that I was malformed. That was the word that was actually used. Um, I was told that my ovaries hadn't developed. Um, I would need to have surgery to remove them. Uh, I'd be on HRT for the rest of my life. Um, I, yeah, there was a, it was a, it was a pretty tough time, if I'm honest. Um, mm. um, so yeah, the, uh, I think it was the use of the word malformed. That was, that was the, that was the thing that I lived with for the next sort of, well, several years, several years, let's put it that way. At um, the age of? 14. 14. Yeah. So, so yeah. Where you Pop- actually shape your everything really. Your identity, yeah, yeah. You, you find, okay, yeah, that's, that sounds horrible, yeah. Carry on, sorry. Yeah. Um, no, it's fine. And I, I kind of lived with that for a while. And then um, I did, so I, my A-levels were in psychology and my psychology textbook talked about intersex people and a lot of the things that they were talking about kind of sounded a lot like my situation. And I was like, what am I? No. And the thing about Swire syndrome is it's actually one of the really less common in sex variations. There are other intersex variations that, that are much, much more common. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so and it, I mean this is I'm giving away my age. This was kind of like pre-internet, you know, that we had no, there was no Wikipedia, there was no, there was no easy way of finding this stuff out. We had a dial-up PC at home, but you know, like mum yelling at you to get off the, get off the um, the internet because she wants to ring your auntie Carol, and you know you're going to be three hours before you can get back online again. I mean, it was you know, I I am old. Um, it sounds like the dark ages now, doesn't it? Age um, is just a so number. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep saying that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, on the other side of 30 I'm <laughs> gonna stick to that. yeah yeah just like you just stop counting that's I'm going backwards now um so yeah so it took me a long time to kind of um just even have the resources to, to look but eventually one day and I think part of me didn't really want to know as well but mm-hmm. I think eventually one day I was just idly kind of surfing online and I found a website that was talking about intersex variations and they talked about Swire syndrome and I kind of went down the list of of all the stuff that kind of went with it and everything was me I was like oh wow bingo and then and it was kind of like and that was like a real heart-stopping moment because I was like this is real this is this I am actually into I'm not even female um and it was just such a massive thing and I just couldn't get my head around it I just kind of completely stayed silent and I was still an outpatient with my consultant so I kind of waited the next however many weeks or months for my next appointment and then when I went in I just challenged her and I said you know am I intersex and she said yes and I said do I have swire syndrome and this wasn't the same consultant who diagnosed me at 14 so it was kind of okay that I could be angry and upset about it okay. um, she was lovely my second consultant was absolutely wonderful and and was really horrified to find that I hadn't been told you know my my full story and she was like well what were you told and I was like I was just told I was malformed that I didn't have ovaries and she was like wow um so yeah so so she confirmed it for me but then of course what I had to do and I would have been about as I say 20 21 22 sometime around there I then had to go home and tell my parents that the person that they thought had been their daughter for the last you know however many years wasn't even female And that was really Mm. hard. That was really hard. You know, kind of, they had so many questions and I'd literally only found out 10 minutes earlier. I had none of the answers. So Mm. yeah, it was, it was. And then of course you carry the stigma and shame of being intersex with you because you've never heard about it before and you don't know anyone else who is. And there's people, there's there's people like you in textbooks, like you're a weirdo, you know, it's kind Mm. of like that. You go from being, you know, a malformed female to being this weird thing that you've never even heard of. So, the, like, the stigma and shame just gets even worse. It, yeah, it was, it was a pretty tough time. It was, it was, it was the agenda network in the civil service that that really kind of changed my life on that one because that was the first I joined, and it was the first time that I'd ever met people who were like me, and who didn't care that I was intersex. You were just like, yeah, cool, great. There's loads of there's loads of intersex people. It's entirely normal. Crack mm. on, come in sit down tell us about yourself you know it was like it was the first time that I'd had that kind of acceptance so that was lovely yeah amazing and I, I know the answer to this one but um I'd like you to share who your biggest champion was throughout your journey who my biggest champion was um I've been really looking that I've had lots and lots of champions I think mm. who are you thinking of you spoke about your dad really highly when I heard oh yeah 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 my lovely dad yeah 
um yeah so I thought you meant the journey from like from joining agenda but yeah no mm-hmm. dad's been there dad predates a lot of that um <laughs> <laughs> yeah um obviously it's it's it, yeah so my dad has always I've always been really I've always been daddy's girl basically um and that was kind of a bit of a shock when I found out I was intersex because it, um I I'm intersex because I have XY chromosomes and my Y chromosome has to, you know, it came from my dad. Uh, so I'm, 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 um, and it was a variation on that chromosome that actually caused me not to develop on, along male lines. So really kind of the reason that I'm intersex is because of my dad. Um, so, and I, like I say, because I've always had a really close living relationship with my dad when I found out that I was intersex and it was kind of his fault. Um, I just pulled his leg about it endlessly. And I was just like, you've given me asthma, you've given me eczema, you've given me this intersex variation. You know, the worst thing my mum ever gave me was her knees because she's got really weird knees. Um, <laughs> so my dad had given me all this. And he, he was just, he was just brilliant. He handled it so well because he was just like, um, well, he said that he, it, he always used to joke that it was deliberate because he really wanted a girl. He really wanted a daughter. Mm. So he reckoned that he would, he deliberately given me this faulty Y chromosome mm. um, because he wanted a girl. So, and that was lovely. That was just such an affirming thing to hear from your dad, you know? Um, and I think, so my dad died in um, 2018, which is why I'm getting upset. Um, and I think... I'm sorry, can I not? It, it, we all go through it don't we um mm. but yeah so when my dad died um it felt kind of like that y chromosome that pesky y chromosome that had caused me so many problems suddenly started to feel like a lot more precious you know because it was like it was a part of him and it was it was all I had left really mm. um so and I I have a copy of my chromosomes um but basically I I chose to have a tattoo of my x y chromosomes done on my wrist um and uh, so this is my y chromosome here this little one uh, this is the troublemaker um and some of my dad's ashes have been mixed with the ink um it's a cremation tattoo so it reminds oh, that me that sounds really special yeah it reminds me uh, every day well it means that you know it reminds me every day that i carry a bit of my dad with me and um it just reminds me how proud i am to be his daughter so yeah thank you for sharing that that's okay it's okay it's 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 one of those family things isn't it you know we're, we're we're all human beings and we all have those connections and you know life is life yeah it's amazing that that you know that that's the sort of response you got from your dad because it's really really uh, important i think to us all you know our family um family acceptance is everything yeah. and i think that's kind of a privilege for intersex people is that nobody can ever suggest that it's a choice you know like in the way that lgbt people get told it's a choice mm-hmm. you know like oh you've chosen to be le-. like who like who chooses to be lesbian or gay or trans or i mean it's just ridiculous but mm-hmm. there's always those people who are like really short-sighted and will say oh it's a choice it's a choice but mm-hmm. intersex people, you can't argue like i did not i, I yeah. didn't choose how i developed in the womb so you know it's it's clearly not a choice i'm just intersex because that's how i was born so because that's nature so, yeah. Yeah, exactly, nature, nature exactly. And it's normal <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's normal to have all different varieties of people Wouldn't life be boring if we were all the same I know. Um, so but my parents i mean my parents have always been kind of like really good about being i mean you know they they they've always been absolutely completely kind of anti-racist pro lgbt so when they found out i was intersex i was kind of i knew i was i was kind of in good hands so Mm -hmm. that's amazing i think what you said about you know uh some people suggesting that being this this or that is is a choice i think intersex is probably one of the subjects that i hope nicely bridges um the the binary world with with the non-binary and and kind of opens that um understanding yeah definitely I mean for me it was kind of like that was the moment when I really realized I think when I found out that I was intersex that was the that was the moment that the the penny really dropped in terms of my LGBT allyship because I was just like well if my if literally my body isn't binary it just like it makes no sense to discriminate against other people for who they love or who they understand themselves to be you know, mm. if you're if you're a lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, whatever, 
you know, great. If you're transgender, great. I just, it's, the, the world is just so complicated and that's what makes it beautiful. Mm. And I, it costs me nothing to be respectful of other people and it costs other people nothing to be respectful to me. And I'm going to fight for a world where everybody's respectful regardless of, 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 of difference. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, that's the thing. No, bravo. To end on, could you tell me why do you do what you do? I think you already mentioned so, some of your reasons there, but why are you an advocate for intersex people? I think uh, the thing for me is that I never want anybody else to go through what I went through. Mm -hmm. And partly that means finding intersex people like, like I've, I found agender or agender found me because they sent out an email that reached me. And I joined and I had that lovely, amazing support and affirmation. And I want to continue that work. I want to continue reaching out and finding people who are intersex, who might have gone through what I went through and who might have felt like a freak or that, you know, that stigma and that, that shame that I was made to feel. And I want to do for them what my network did for me. Um, I want to raise the profile of intersex because i think it's a two-pronged thing not only do we have to support the intersex people themselves but we have to change society we have to get society to a place where they can understand that what you were taught in primary school about you know willies and vaginas is you know that real life is a little bit more complicated than that and you know you bashing away on facebook saying if you've got a penis you're a man you know is is, is that's where you're at you're at primary school there um yeah. let's grow up let's understand that that people you know biology is a little bit more complicated than that and let's be okay with the fact that some people exist who are outside that nice neat binary of male and female so um so it's a two-pronged thing i want to support intersex people themselves but I, I i'm also driven to kind of change society and make society more understanding and accepting of of variation you know individual differences amazing it, it is the people it is the people like you who do change society so I uh, really, really thank you for this conversation. <laughs> You're um, welcome. <laughs> well, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank yeah. you ever so much for having me. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed this. And uh, yeah, I do hope that everyone watches it and understands for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed.